for the United States during the Carter administration, and back then he played a major role in the normalization of relations between the U.S. and China. I sat down with him recently to talk about that historic moment and to get his perspective on the road ahead. Dr. Brzezinski, when you work in the White House, you know that you're going to make history, but on this historic event 35 years ago, any idea at that time how this relationship would blossom and in all the different directions it would go in? We certainly had high expectations, but at the same time, they were defined by the geopolitical context in which we were operating. We were still engaged in a very serious competition with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a serious threat to us. That, to some extent, defined the framework for the relationship. But what was important at that instance was that the normalization of relations with China and the intensifying and increasingly cordial dialogue with the Chinese leaders made possible rather significant cooperation with China against the Soviet threat as jointly perceived. President Nixon made his trip there, but it seemed like the negotiations took a while before uh, 1979. Can you take us back in time? What were some of the difficulties? How did you thread the needle? What was it like? Well, first of all, one has to give credit to President Nixon's and Henry Kissinger's initiative. They broke the ice. Uh, they did. But they confronted a residue of suspicion, and that suspicion was mutual, and grievances and they were also mutual, that it really took time for the relationship to sort of become more normal, more predictable, and eventually what we accomplished was that it became, in fact, open and full, comprehensive, and, in fact, initiated a kind of secret uh, collaboration, or even perhaps you could call it an alliance. So it took time. Uh, but what I think convinced the Chinese that it was in their interest to have that relationship with us was a combination of two factors. Deng Xiaoping realized that China was beginning to stagnate economically. And he had the good sense to realize that a breakthrough in the relationship with the United States would make it possible to unleash the productive forces of Chinese society. So he had an incentive. And secondly, he became convinced that we were serious in opposing the Chinese, that we were not seeking a de facto status quo accommodation with the Soviets, but that we were interested in rolling them back. And I think that was a very important message that the Chinese finally internalized, and which gave them an incentive to be quite cooperative in the eventual joint effort on this issue. I uh, spoke to uh, Chung Lee yesterday. We've done a lot of interviews about the 35-year anniversary, and he, he said something that I thought was very interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on it. He said, Reagan's largely credited with the fall of the Soviet Union, but he says uh, it's really Nixon, Kissinger, Carter, Brzezinski, who really laid the foundation, marginalizing uh, the Soviet Union, that they really kind of set the table. What are your thoughts on that? I think there's a great deal to that, but there's also an overstatement in that context. And Nixon was very anti-Soviet, anti-communist, but he basically was prepared, in part because of his domestic difficulties, to settle for the status quo. That is to say, don't threaten us, don't push us, don't be aggressive against us, but in a way, the implicit message of those years was, you keep what you have, we keep what you, we have, and let's, on that basis, seek some arms control, seek some reduction in weapons, and so forth. I may sound self-serving here, but it was really under Carter and then under Reagan that we transformed the relationship into one in which we were competing on the issue of human rights and demonstrating to the world and to the Russians themselves that when it comes to human rights, the United States was pointed in the right direction and they were pointed in the wrong direction, and that was in our interest to, in fact, to put it politely, transform them from within, which probably in an impolite language means undermine them. <laughs> um, President Xi, uh, the third plenum just occurred, and he's really pushing for uh, 
economic reforms, uh, going after corruption. How do you see that changing the relationship with the United States going forward? Well, first of all, you know, I always shudder a little bit when I hear us talk about corruption elsewhere. There's a hell of a lot of corruption in the United States. It's sad to say, but there is. Maybe an extenuating factor is that we can say that we have regularized corruption. We have semi-legalized it. Yeah, but look, it's hard to look at our political system without the word corruption coming out of your ears. Um, so first of all, we're not so holy, and they're not so sick. But having said that, I do have to say that they're establishing some records in corruption, and that is becoming a very serious problem for the Chinese government. What about the economic reforms? Look, first of all, they show that they're aware of the fact that they have to have reforms. Two, they're trying to implement reforms, and on a huge scale. And that scale is monumental. I once asked President Chai Tsemin, who was two presidents back, and he's still alive, what was his biggest difficulty in running China? And he answered me in three words, which he spat out like this, too many Chinese. <laughs> and it's a fact. It's very hard to reform a country in which there are one billion, three hundred million people. And the risk, of course, is that it will spin out of control and not be a reform, but produce massive destructive upheaval. So they do have this inbuilt problem that limits their ability to really be truly reformist. But when you look at that recent decision of the top leadership, it outlines reforms in almost every sector of socioeconomic life. And they're pointed in that direction. I'm in no position to make predictions here. I know it will be difficult, but we shouldn't underestimate their ability to, to stay committed to this idea. You know, it's interesting you brought up about uh, that comment about too many Chinese. Uh, I saw President George W. Bush speak in uh, Dallas, Texas last year, and he said that he had a private conversation with Hu Jintao, and he said, I always like to, when I'm around a world leader, say, what keeps you up at night? He goes, it's a great icebreaker. People talk. And he said that Hu Jintao said, I got to find jobs for all these people every year. And, and I think in America, we don't really think about how difficult a task that is. That's right. No, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, they have several hundred million people who are kind of former agricultural laborers who are periodic seasonal employees in house building industry and so forth, floating throughout the country from areas where there is openings uh, two areas where there's openings from areas in which there are no openings and you know it's just huge huge mass of people that has to be sheltered and fed and kept under control you mentioned uh, prior to this relationship grievances and suspicions I wrote down those two words because you mentioned them it seems though that there are still uh, grievances and suspicions 35 years later how serious a problem is that I think that this is becoming potentially a serious problem. And I think it is the consequence of, at this stage, really unintended actions by each. I fully endorse the President's, President Obama's effort to def redefine, or perhaps uh, not redefine, but reaffirm America's role in the Far East. But unfortunately, the speech he gave was um, designed in such a fashion that it emphasized words that would be catchy. And I'm referring to the so-called pivot speech, which gave the impression that our real realignment regarding the Far East is, first of all, military. And implicit in that, at least to the Chinese, so it seemed, was the notion that means we'll be containing the Chinese. And this is the way some Asian countries also interpreted it, and try to take advantage of it. I think this has set the Chinese off in a direction which is uh, unfortunate and perhaps historically premature because at some point down the pike perhaps they did anticipate having to engage in some sort of competition with us head on in the terms of predominance. But they certainly weren't going to do it now. But I think this triggered them. It then unleashed their sort of anxieties and resentments and maybe reawakened historical grievances.
which they want to articulate more openly. And increasingly, they have started portraying us as a threat. And that then coincided with these territorial claims that the Chinese have had for a long time, which they to some extent surfaced a couple of years ago, but then they backed off. And now they have made them more explicit and more head-on. And as a consequence, we could be heading into a period of some mutual unpleasantness. I hope we avoid it. I think it's unnecessary. I think we still have more interests in common than matters at issue. And so I hope that both leaderships do what is necessary. I think certainly the President of the United States has no intention of aggravating the relationship. And I think the rather pragmatic new president of China also feels the same way. So we should be able to contain it, but to contain it, we have to be aware of what's at stake. And we also have to be aware of the fact that we don't have to waive the military uh, sort of symbol of some sort. All we have to say is we've been part of the Far East since 1905, the Portsmouth Treaty between Russia and Japan. That's when we really entered and decided to stay in the Far East. It's an extension of the Pacific. And that's all we need to say. We don't need to sort of imply some sort of special military responsibility. Uh, China just came up with the ADIZ. The United States responded. Two B-52s go through. Um, well, that's exactly what I have in mind. Yeah, and, and then we also saw these two ships. You know, there's, there's been reports that they almost collided. That's um, right. These are serious, I mean, it could become serious they could. Miscalc they miscalculations. They could, and they so breed if, animals. If, if you were to uh, advise President Obama, I mean, if you're in the White House now, what would you say to kind of lower the tensions, or is there a way? Well, I think, first of all, it has to be mutual, mm -hmm. because in this kind of situation, if somebody takes unilateral initiatives to lower the tensions, it can look like we're just conceding points and backing off, which might have the opposite effect, namely breed the other side's appetite. And the same goes the other way. I do think we ought to be talking to the Chinese a little bit about some of the problems that could arise, that could arise because of this overlapping air control, airspace control. But we also have to take into account Chinese sensitivities, which perhaps we're ignoring. I'll give you an example. How would you feel if Chinese warships were patrolling periodically off San Diego? Very good point. How would you feel if Chinese aircraft were flying just on the edge of our airspace, on the edge of our western coast? That's what we're doing every month, maybe several times a month. Why? I mean, the Korean War has ended ages ago. There is no imminent threat to Taiwan, which may have been another reason for doing it. Uh, why do this when you know that this must absolutely outrage the Chinese military and breeds in their officer corps an attitude that when we are ready, we're going to change things dramatically. Why not say to them, look, we have the following reasons. Maybe there are some special reasons I don't know about that we're doing it, but let's think of how maybe this can be altered. And there are other subjects of the story we could be talking to each other about. Um, <laughs> obviously North Korea and we have been doing that and we have to think of that as a joint problem Taiwan we did promise the Chinese that will disengage gradually and will not continue indefinitely arms sales just think that was first mentioned by Nixon and Kissinger we reaffirmed it that's decades ago changes need to come on both sides, I guess. Yeah, and by mutual accommodation and in a good mood, and not in the context of accusations. And if you look at the Chinese military press, and bear in mind, Chinese press is censored. So it's not just somebody sounding off because they feel like sounding off. It's censored. But some of the military press writes things about the United States which are very hostile. Very hostile. Dr. Brzezinski, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. Good to talk to you. When we come back, the view from China, we'll hear from a man who was once a translator for Dong Xiaoping. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We're discussing the relationship between China and the United States as we mark the 35th anniversary of the normalization of relations between the two nations. Joining us now from Beijing is Victor Gao. He is an international expert on Chinese issues, and it's always great to have you on the broadcast. Let me ask you, Victor, take us back in time to 1979, this historic moment in time. What, how was it viewed there in China? Well, first of all, when Deng Xiaoping re-emerged uh, from persecution in China for the third time, uh, he became the paramount leader. And one of the first things he did was to uh, normalize relations uh, with, between China and the United States when President Carter was the U.S. president at that time. And that was one of the most important historical events in modern history because China and the United States uh, normalized the relations and uh, they cooperated closely, which eventually led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And I think uh, ever since then, the relations between China and the United States, despite of many ups and downs, you know, bumpiness, etc., have been more or less uh, very well handled. And eventually, it is a relationship of mutual benefit for the Chinese nation as well as for the people in the United States. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but, but I want to take us back in time a little bit because we have an expression here in the United States, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for some of these meetings. You were that person there in those meetings, an interpreter uh, for Dong Xiaoping. Talk to me about what a heady time that must have been for you sitting there witnessing history like that. I was very privileged and 